Welcome back to Damien Richardson.online, where we are continuing. Definitely today, we're continuing to have the difficult conversations. We're talking to uh, a retired academic, Frank Salter. Once we hear the title of the book that he's reached, recently published uh, with a colleague of his, Harry Richardson, I think we might wonder whether he actually retired if he was thrown out of academia, because the name of the book is um, Anglophobia, the Unrecognised Hatred. Uh, Frank Salter, welcome to the show. Nice, nice to be here. Now, Frank, what what prepossessed you to even be, to begin to uh, write a book with uh, that uh, title? Well, what what began it was I received a six thousand word email, in effect, from my co-author Harry Richardson, and he said, "I've got an idea for an article. We thought it would be a you know maybe about that long, six thousand words." It, it went to, to almost 10 times that. And he had this argument, which is the structure of the book, which mm-hmm. is talking about everyone else can have their home country, but not us, uh, Anglo-Australians and all other U- European nations are not permitted to have their own country where they remain the super majority, not just a 51% majority, mm-hmm. but an 85 a 90% majority, which most other people's aspire to that it might not have it but they aspire to it they can they can lobby for it they can agitate for it and they're not called nazis right um uh so territory is homeland is a basic one or control of immigration and so on and so forth and i thought this is rhetorically really powerful so t- between us his 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 uh, uh concept of the book it became a book project took us a year and with my academic training together it was a great combination and we came up with this with this um uh, with this book um that i think covers a lot of the lot of the sensitive areas the book was only recently published wasn't it yeah earlier this year earlier this year how's it been received in academic circles and uh, also by the uh, broader public not not one review it's just it's just been ignored except on the dissident dissident uh, side of politics mm-hmm. it's dissident right it's been been acknowledged been been reviewed um it was published initially in quadrant magazine which is australia's premier uh, intellectual magazine for conservatives mm. quadrant magazine it's been running for 50 60 years so it was published a huge you know series four long articles were the other heart of, of the book so that was good and we had good good responses from readers there but uh, in academe no i think i can't think of one review so why is it being ignored talk us through that process why would it be uh ignored you have fine credentials you worked overseas uh as part of academia as well as in australia as well as your colleague so why would it be ignored well for the same reason that uh, i could not find a, a job in australia I had to work overseas at a research institute in in Europe for 20 years. I couldn't find work in Australia. Why? Because my field of study, it's not right wing or anything, but it, it, I, I study human nature and how that how that underpins political systems. So I'm a political scientist trained at Sydney University, PhD Griffith University in Brisbane. Uh, my my doctoral dissertation was published by Oxford University Press. You can't do better than that. And my 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 supervisor, my professor, said, "You've got it. You're home and hosed, Frank. You're home and hosed. This is it. I mean, if Oxford publishes your PhD dissertation, you you, you can just sort of name your position. It's great. No chance. I had just no chance. And and for that same reason, the book is just ignored. Books on the right are just ignored. So it proves your thesis in many respects, doesn't it? It does. It does." And what is your thesis? That the that there's been a cultural revolution which uh, became manifest. It started earlier, but it, it became manifest in the 1960s. You know, with this with the student rebellions across mm-hmm. the West, and then went through to the 1970s. It's called the counterculture. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it was pretty easy to notice, and it was called a cultural cultural revolution. But it went much deeper, and what it reflected was a change in cultural elites. Right through the West's history and the history of other countries, 
their intellectual elites have reflected, th th those elites have belonged to the people. They've been part of the people. They've come from the people often. Uh, and they haven't critiqued or sought, sought to tear down the, the basic society, the structure of society and so on. They've actually been loyal to it, although critical of us, you know, critical here and there, of course, being intellectuals, got to be critical of something, I suppose. Mm. But uh, they wouldn't want to tear down the whole structure. That changed. Now, there's a literature on this. Um, Eric Kaufman, for example, his uh, 2004 book, The Rise and Fall of Anglo-America. Eric mm. Kaufman, still mm. alive, valuable colleague. Uh, Harvard University Press is his mainstream academe. And he pointed out that by the 1950s, the cosmopolitan left had captured elite American universities. The American, the American university system at the top, not the bottom of it, there is like two or 3,000 American universities, most of them low-powered two-year uh, colleges. But the elite ones, Princeton, Harvard, you know, and, this, and the big state systems, those universities were in effect captured by the late 1950s. Ten years later, you have the student uprising, hating America, hating its history, hating the, their ancestors, mm -hmm. and, and and which really peaked in the 1970s. And people look back and they think, oh, that, yeah, that, that's interesting, but it's gone now. No, it's not gone. The rebels are now professors. The re rebels became the professors. The rebels change the curriculum so that our school system now in Australia, this, this trickle down to Australia because all these academic disciplines are global. So you have a, you know, the, the society, the society for political science, for example, has international connections. They're all linked. And so Is that as a result of our connection to the U S empire, because we're part of that empire, a Susanry, I would say of the American empire. And as a result, that civil rights movement that you talk about that really took hold in the 60s, then we got it by corollary to just just to, to maintain, to be part of that empire. Is that right? Yeah, I think I think there is a connection, but it's deeper than that. There are civilizational connections. So Australia was traditionally uh, connected with Britain and Britain had the peak academic bodies and then Australian universities would hire them. Now, as we matured, we trained up our own academics, fine, but there's at any serious scientific or academic discipline will be global, will be international, because it doesn't matter who comes up with an idea. It can be black skin, white skin, could be, you know, Asian, could be whatever. If it's a, if it's truth, it's truth. If it's science, it's 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 science. So these these disciplines are fundamentally international in their outlook. And so when you have dominant metropolitan powers such as Britain during its empire days or America during its empire days, um, it has tremendous uh, ability to capture that, to influence the overall flavour of disciplines and also of culture. So America also was a major, the global major exporter of popular culture, Hollywood, musical culture and so on. Um, and part of that, Britain became part of that that power structure. So those these ideas flowed down. So uh, Australian, for example, Australian immigration policy has roughly been in remained in sync with American immigration policy. So America opened its doors to third world immigration in 1965, a piece mm -hmm. piece of legislation that dismant which dismantled what they had in place, which which basically forged, made America what it was, which is a, an extension of European civilization. Um, 1965, that was dismantled. In Australia, it was 1969. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so there's a, been a rough correspondence. Why? Because these trends are, are international, and it's not just because of who, who is currently in power in America. It's deeper than that. It's, it's more deep state. It's more deep state uh, or or establishment um, power involved. Yeah, because it's not party political then, is it, at all? Because no. in 69 it would have been a Liberal uh, Prime Minister in Australia. Exactly. That Holt. brought around this, Holt, yes, to brought around this cultural change. Exactly. So it was. My, it began mildly, 
and uh, and then it became more and more radical. And you had Whitlam, and already Whitlam's seventy two to seventy five were his years. Uh, already he introduced political multiculturalism as the official ideology, which from then on more and more governed immigration policy and also domestic ethnic policy. Who's on top? What what is the ethnic hierarchy? Well, it wasn't us on top anymore. I can tell you, it, 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 it flipped the hierarchy yeah. to be minority centric. So the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant was on top previous to this cultural shift. You're saying that occurred post Second World War. Yeah, and th- this was the case from the beginning. As the Australian immigration policy made Australia. It forged what we are, uh, our basic identity, which is at its heart, it's it's Anglo, but in in the broader sense of being, being Western civilization and so on. So it encompasses uh, uh, Irish, encompasses Scottish, and then comp- goes beyond the British Isles to people from a broad European background. Now we had a shock to the system in the mid nineteenth century during the gold rushes, when there was, for a time, unrestricted Chinese immigration. Mm. And the Chinese being what they are, hardworking, studious, you know, and they went overseas. There was a gold rush. Why wouldn't they? So it was, but it didn't work out culturally. It was a disaster, actually, culturally. And that really shocked the six colonies because several of them had had their own gold rushes at different times. Yes. It was a shock. And so when the federal federation movement began in the 1890s and then culminated in 1901 with the Commonwealth being created. Mm-hmm. Uh, or the, the first piece of legislation, the first was the Restrictive Immigration Act. And th- that was the first, the most important thing that they, they had on the table. And they said, well, obviously we ha- m- must have, the point wasn't, uh, as the left would say, oh, it's Anglo supremacism. The point was assimilation. That was the point. The point was to pr- bring people in who would readily assimilate. And in the great speeches leading up to Federation and immediately after Federation, they pointed at the United States as an ex- as a negative example of where not to go if you want to have a cohesive country. They pointed to, to the Civil War. They pointed to slavery, the the, the terrible conflict over, over, liber- over freeing uh, the black uh, black slaves mm-hmm. and this terrible conflict which killed 600,000 Americans it was tore America apart during the Civil War in the 1860s and I said we don't want that so they they, they, they were determined so, so Australian immigration policy can be taken back actually taken back right to Arthur Phillip the first governor or, the, and the, or Hunter immediately after him when it was put to him, listen, we need more women. Let's bring in some women from from the uh, Pacific Islands, set from the South Pacific. We can find lots of women there. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, he said, "Ah, uh, <laughs> no, I think we'll do it ourselves. I, I think we can, we can, we'll bring women." For, uh, that that if he'd made a different decision, our history would be different. We'd now be a different people. We'd be paying a lot more reparations to another group of people too yes, exactly. uh, at this particular point in time. That restrictive immigration act that you're talking about now is uh, there's no subtlety or no understanding of where it's actually come from historically, like you've just talked us through. It's just used, it's weaponized now against yeah. the nation as just being inherently racist from uh, its inception. Exactly. And what is not taught is that it, this goes back to uh, some pretty wise people uh, contributed to that to that policy. The, my my favourite to, to to I have two favourites. One is the great um, English scholar. What was his name? John John Stuart Mill. Mm-hmm. John Stuart Mill, the father of liberalism, by the way. The to father on liberty. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the father of women's rights. He wrote the first major essay on saying this is outrageous that women don't have the vote and so on. So he was a really fundamental pioneer of liberalism. He wrote another book that the left never talks about, which is was called uh, On Nationality. I think it was called On Nationality. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, if you want to have a cohesive country, you need to have people uh, uh, have it formed from people of the same background. And he put it differently. He, he approached it from the point of 
of your individual rights, which you'd expect a liberal to do. What 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 would a person with liberty choose? And he said, if you just look at the world, what people choose to do is live among their own kind. Mm -hmm. They choose that. And by the way, that's true in Australia now. It's true in every multicultural society. You get people clustering, Mm -hmm. clustering together, not because they're whipped there, but because they choose. They they want to they live among comfortable you know people now as intermarriage happens that blurs of course and you you get integration happening mm-hmm. but but sometimes you don't get integration happening like the American racial scene is it is a disaster because you know you, the the intermarriage rate between black and white is it's there but it's very low it's at a very low standard. So you talk about these things. What explains the inconsistencies? Because I think of many instances now, like India seems to remain predominantly Indian. There seems to be no problem with that. I guess they would point to the British Raj and they would use that as an excuse to say, you know, look what happened when we let you guys in. Uh, Japan r- remains ostensibly Japanese. And, of course, uh, the uh, nation state you're not allowed to talk about as made being ethnocentric is Israel. And that seems to maintain uh, its ethnic identity without a problem. So why is it a problem, as you outlined right from the get-go, that, uh, that uh, a white nation cannot uh, identify itself as being such? Where, where's that inconsistency coming from, that yeah. hypocrisy? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but this is an ac- a field of academic research that's ongoing. I'm not sure, but I, I have some insights. I think some some facts we can point at. To begin with, multiculturalism is is a mongrel theory or is a mongrel movement. I'm using that term uh, uh, advisedly because it, we'll call it an unholy alliance between the far left radic- radical cosmopolitan left. On the one side, they're the master, uh, the power, the power center, but they have as clients minorities, typically immigrant minorities, but sometimes indigenous minorities. That that's the truth in Australia as well. So multiculturalism is a combine of the far left and the far tribal right, but of limited to minorities. Now, how can such contradiction hold together? And the reason it holds together is they have a common enemy. Who's that? It's us. Mm-hmm. It's Western nations who have brought in immigrants. It, it, and it's based on a partly on a Marxist fundamental Marxist critique of of the West of Western nations. Globalists and 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 globalism is a strong uh, thread in this. Globalism is opposed to borders per se. It's a, it's opposed to identity, religious, cultural. Mm-hmm. Ethnic, as opposed to all that, it's saying it's the brotherhood, brotherhood of man and sisterhood of mankind um, utopia. So the utopia is, oh, we'll have a world government. And once we've had that, and once everyone's mixed together on no no borders, no more war. War will go. We won't mm. have any more war. So, mm. so you have um, Mr. Brown, the ex head of the Australian Greens, for example, has been yep. repeatedly calling for a global government. Yes. Without thinking what is in the interests of the Australian people. And the last thing we want is a global government elected on proportional representation. Because if I lived in the third world, the first thing I would vote for is is stripping Australia of its wealth and spreading it across around the third world. Of course. Mm-hmm. Of course. That's what I'd want. You, you know, these these Western societies, not all Western. Um, Japan has done the same. South Korea has done the same. So uh, Singapore has done the same. Have created a law governed, basically with human rights, civil rights, tremendously wealthy, generous welfare systems. These are attractive societies, and uh, and other people are naturally they're envious. They're envious of that. They want to be there if they can. Many of them want to be there. I think. A some some a figure of something close to a billion people around the world want to move to the West. They would like to move to a Western country. So that's an Im- it's an impossibility, isn't it? No, it's absolutely possible to have a billion people move to the West and for it to maintain its sense oh. of self. Oh, you've added you've added some conditions there. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. It's impossible if one wants to preserve the West. 
But if you if you set that aside, as our cultural elites do, because our elites are not, our elites are in effect hostile. I think mm. it's they're more cold than hostile. They just don't care. They don't have a sense of identity. There's a great there's a great book written in in Britain about ten years ago called the Somewheres and the Anywheres, that the a fundamental divide um, is in politics is between people who identify with the local. Yes, they identify as Australians or Poms, or they identify as Germans or Hungarians or Chinese or whatever it might be, and then then you have this very small elite, the one percent, who could be anywhere. Mm, cosmopolitan urban elite, internationalist exactly. in their understanding of exactly. uh, place exactly. and location. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they and they they send their children to whatever international schools, and they're so wealthy. These people are typically billionaires. Or with wealth in the hundreds of millions, mm. but not only they are financially secure. They're not only their children are financially secure as the money trickles down. Their their grandchildren and great grandchildren will be financially secure. So they feel, and they live in gated suburbs. They, the children go to private elite schools. So these are the modern citizens of the world. Basically, they don't care about anyone. So it's a new feudalism, isn't it? It's a new feudalistic class. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So. The, it's becoming a mainstream view in the United States political science uh, discipline now that America has not been a democracy for quite some time. It's a it's a plutocracy. Mm. And you talk about the civil rights movement. You talk about it coming to Australia, particularly born in the US and coming to Australia around sixty nine. Harold Holt is the uh, you know so called conservative prime minister, liberal at the time. So is democracy a sham? Is it just a there's a bu- bureaucratic uh, a global elite that is actually in control that makes actually no difference who you would vote for? That's just window dressing. It's just a pretense to democracy because it's going to dominate no matter what this uh, what this uh, urban global elite want to happen, and and it's rolling out as you say rightly across the West. It, it doesn't matter who's in power. I think there's a lot of truth in that. I, I wouldn't go that far. But I'm in that in that direction. I think that that it's getting out that way. For example, it does matter who we vote for. Um, there's left globalists and there's right globalists. The right globalists mm-hmm. are these the very wealthy mm-hmm. uh, billionaires and so on. The left globalists are the are the Marxist neo Marxian u- u- utopian thinkers. Yes. So it does matter who, who who you think about who who you vote for. For example, just to give one recent example in Australia. Um, if one voted Labor, if Labor had continued to rule um, from Keating on, the boats would not have been stopped. Labor was slow to drag themselves, kicking and screaming to the to the realization we must stop the boat people. Howard, to his credit, stopped that. Howard's still in effect a globalist, though, because 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 the legal immigration policy was flooding Australia. Mm. creating all these mm. uh, minority um, communities that didn't have to be there. Mm. So he was a disaster for Australia, but a disaster of a different kind to to, to Labor. You see what I mean? But the trajectory was still the same. There was still an increase in net immigration to Australia under yeah. Howard from what had happened previously, you even say, uh, under Keating. Exactly. And what's missing in all these, in, in all these policy areas is the majority founding nation perspective mm. so that is blocked out in the west by the way not in not in india where the hindu nationalists have been ruling for for many years now with modi as their as the yep. prime minister yeah uh, not in china which has realized that that, that marxism is the is just rubbish and they mm. and they're moving to legitimize their rule their rather dictatorial rule with uh, ethno nationalism is it national socialist country, um, China? Yeah, with the Han yeah, the Chinese problem, the as problem. a preeminent. Yeah, but the problem with using a term like that is you you conjure up Nazi Germany and and it gets you confu- you know it confuses mm-hmm. the issue. But one might argue technically the national socialist, but that that term itself is loaded. It's had a lot has a lot of baggage. But they are they are an ethnic nationalist authoritarian government, and Australia is not. Um, uh, forming its immigration policy according to what they are. 
that Australia's immigration policy is being conducted as if we know nothing about ethnicity or nationalism, mm. as if we know nothing. We know a lot. The social sciences have come a long way. We know, for example, that ethnocultural, especially religious as well, diversity is negative. There are serious costs to social cohesion and to economic growth of diversity. But you wouldn't know that if you talk, if, you know, if you look at Australian government policy, you wouldn't know that. They talk about the joy of diversity. They talk mm. about diversity is our strength. That's strength. a complete mm. lie. That's a complete lie. We know diversity is is costly. And in the end, and, and, and it, it lowers the threshold to civil war. So there have been, you know, uh, illustrious studies done in in, politi in by political scientists have shown again and again, diversity is a risk factor for for civil war, for breakdown, and so on. So no, that civil conflict. I've heard some people say that that's the uh, potential for the U.S. in particular for there to be civil war 2.0. Is that something you could uh, envision envision happening? Well, uh, it's absolutely horrific if it happened. Uh, a, a, a way to approach it um, from political science perspective would be the breakup of the United States. Is the United States heading in the direction of a breakup? And it is in that direction. But I think there are tremendous barriers to a real civil war getting underway. But it's heading in that direction. For example, and it's not just America, around mm. the West, mm. trust in the government is just collapsing. Trust in the major political parties is falling away. So in Australia, uh, the major political parties have never enjoyed a lower, never had a lower support from the population. All these minor parties popping up, right? People are just losing confidence, losing trust in the government. I think belatedly, they should have lost this trust 50 years ago when it became obvious that the, that the, uh, Australia, that the nation was no longer favoured by the broader political system. I mean, mm. Instead, minorities are being favoured. But it's an impossibility to lose faith in it because what can you do? There's a compulsory voting system, and if you don't vote, you're outside of the system anyway, so the system still continues on as a result because through the two-party preferred system, it's almost an impossibility to bring about any realistic change, and because of the weaponization of the media, of the corporate media, it won't allow any voices to operate outside of the a very particular Overton window it creates. That's why you're book is being ignored and that's why this conversation we're having now if it was to ever ga gain any mainstream traction we would be dismissed as uh being uh fascists um i think you're wrong luckily i think you're wrong <laughs> gladly mm -hmm. yeah uh, what you just said is based on a lot of lot of unfortunate facts but there are, and there's another side to it that the solution is not political it's cultural mm. because what we're suffering is the downstream effect of a cultural revolution of, in the 60s and 70s so it's cultural next we have the internet so te technological change has made it more and more difficult to for elites to monopolize the means of of cultural production and, and distribution Yes, Marxist and that's a real concern Marxist. to them. That's what the misinformation, disinformation bills are about. I'm sure. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. So, so they are now. What? What? One thing is fascinating is the closer we, especially the Anglosphere, comes to the majority being sub, uh, demographically submerged, so we can't fight back politically because mm. we'll be in the minority. In America, it's in twenty years' time. Twenty years' time, they're predicted to be minority white. Mm -hmm. And Australia, we keep such poor records, it's not difficult to know what the ethnic proportions mm. are, but we're on a similar track, I'd say, maybe a bit longer. Uh, in Britain, it's not as bad. But what's what's strange is that the closer we get to that submergence and that final defeat, the more uh, totalitarian the, the establishment's becoming. We get these draconian laws coming in, these these with these so-called it's ironic human rights commissions mm. it's mm. quite ironic mm. human rights commission what are they there for basically to crush the free speech of the majority mm. they're, they're essentially an anti-free speech um, organization 
Or well, they're anti-white, aren't they, in their underpinnings? Especially white. Yeah. Mm. Especially white. Mm. They're, there, they're there to crush. Um, so why is that? Why are they becoming more draconian? And how can it be that every major social media company was on the side of, for example, the COVID lockdowns? They mm. censored anyone, any dissident mm. voices saying, oh, hold on, mm. what about the antivirals? Couldn't mm. we use it? just use well-tested antiviral? No. No, you're a terrorist. You're a denier. You're, mm. You know, mm. why is it happening now? And I, I, I don't know why. But uh, just to, just to speculate, it could be that because they have the power, they're doing it. But that doesn't explain. Elon Musk is a standout because he's taken over Twitter X now. Mm-hmm. He's taken it over, and he he wants more free speech in that area. In that area, but. Why was why is he a standout? Why isn't it, why aren't social media companies across the political spectrum? What do you expect? Some on the left, some on the right, some on the most clustering in the middle. No, they're all on the cosmopolitan left, censoring um, patriots, mm. censoring people with with uh, different views on COVID or whatever the the topic might be. Uh, why? H- how can that work? Elon Musk in a battle at the moment, isn't he, with the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, which is a, a Jewish organisation, and they've uh, really gone after Musk because he's opened up the people that can now engage with his social media platform, Twitter, now known as X, Platform X. Um, that's a really seminal fight, isn't it? That's a fight I would have never seen happening even four or five years years ago that someone would take on the power of something like the anti-defamation league yeah i I prefer to call it the dl the defamation league that's what Mm. they 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 define destroy people's careers and lives lives they're basically a hate group the the adl is a hate group that's what they do now isn't it they weapon i take away your livelihood in your yeah they just just destroy you people don't realize that that for example the debanking movement they they um, who was it? The who's the uh, who's the uh, politician in the uh, in the UK was just debanked. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, Nigel Farage. Farage. Nigel yeah, Farage. yeah. Mm. But he's just the he's just the latest. He's the tip of the iceberg. Is someone that one that they're willing to actually talk about? But there's mm. others have been debanked, including Australian dissidents for years, many years before. Years. Yeah. Debanked. Now one might yeah. not agree with their politics, but it's typically on the right. They don't debank cosmopolitans they don't debank people on the left they don't debank feminists lgbtqi plus whatever it might mm. be no no mm. they wouldn't be debanked it's only only patriots and and people on the right others on the right but about the adl they're not much of a jewish organization anymore i can tell you they they they, they have in the leadership these severe criticisms of, of israel Mm-hmm. From their cosmopolitan perspective, Israel does not really have a right to exist as a Jewish state. And if it's not a Jewish state, it's really the whole Zionist uh, mission has been frustrated. So so Israel is also suffering from, and it's ironic because, you know, there, there there's a Jewish contingent on the left. I understand mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But but they're, they're often not friendly to Israel at all. Israel, well, Jonathan Greenblatt heads it, doesn't he? He's, Jonathan Greenblatt. I mean, yeah. he, he's no great friend of Israel, if you ask me. I, I, I don't see that. So so it's become they've become rogue in a way. They're, they're initially a Jewish organization, but they've become mm. rogue. They're not, they're not really friendly to Israel. Israel can only survive by controlling its borders, its immigration policy, for example, and making sure that they have a super majority in within the country, not not a hundred percent majority, but a but a large majority. That's the only. And the same thing goes for Hungary, for China, for Australia, for any country. If the state does not reflect the the uh, interests of the majority, protecting minority rights, of course, that's mm. liberal democracy. You protect everyone's individual rights, but group rights should be should be protected the majority founding group should be protected it seems to me and that's what's that's what's changed in australia and america and britain and and, and across the west the the state apparatus has since the 1970s say not uh supported the interests of the majority of the majority now that's an incredible statement because what would you expect in a, in a democracy Rule mm. of the majority. Mm. 
with minority rights protected. That makes it a liberal democracy, not just mm. democracy. Mm. Democracy can be savage. Democracy can be unpleasant. But if you have liberal democracy, you have individual rights protected constitutionally and legally, separation. Equality under the rule of law. Equality under the rule of law. But then yeah. basically, but that doesn't mean that you can ignore the interests of the majority. Then it's not even democratic anymore. <laughs> so, so this is what's happened. And we need to somehow take back our countries and find a way to reverse this uh, cultural revolution that, that's occurred, where where that that has given us hostile elites. How Elite- can that happen? How could it happen that the majority would be subsumed by a minority, and the minority would have uh, a whip hand morally? End up having a whip hand. It's only because of the compliance of the majority, isn't it? So somehow it's been weaponized against us through the institutions, particularly through education, where you feel a sense of guilt. Uh, they pick on Australia particularly, and we'll probably get to talking about the voice debate that's uh, upon us at the moment, mm. the guilt that we're uh, given for our inhabitation of this landmass in the first place. But somehow anyone that comes post Second World War is okay. They're forgiven yeah. for yeah. inhabiting the landmass, but those with any antecedents before the Second World War are not forgiven. Exactly. And and it's universal. So when I was living in Europe, my, my colleagues in Europe couldn't believe. They said, yeah, but 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 France is especially evil because we had the, the <gasps> we had the empire. Yes. Or the Germans would say, Oh, but we're no, 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 no. You're okay, but we we have the Holocaust in World War Two. We yes. and I said I said to them, guys, you're not special. We're all in the, all in the same boat. In Australia, mm. we 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 have the Aborigines, and we have this, and we were colonialists, and, mm-hmm. and we had we had why the white Australia policy, why the white mm. Australia policy, and they mm. looked at me, and I said, you're not special. Every country, the majority is demonised. Now, how can that be? How is Europe such an evil place? That were uniquely evil. That all the European countries must be replaced by other people. That that that's that's the implication. And that's why the other people want to go there in the first place because it's exactly. so inherently evil that they can't wait to get out of their own country and come potentially to start a new life uh, with more prosperity uh, exactly. in a Western democracy. That's right. That's right. So it's I don't know the answer to all this, but, but there there are some strange things happening. You ask me how. Well, I can give some micro information on that mm-hmm. for example let's let's consider say two prime ministers malcolm fraser and bob hawke absolutely mm-hmm. instrumental in in installing multiculturalism against the wishes of the australian people whenever the australian people were polled would you like australia would would you want more uh, asian immigration or whatever it might be and they said well no we'd actually prefer to remain who we are actually there was no great hatred involved just normal human ethnocentrism ethnocentrism is an adaptive psychological state it's where you you're self-regarding you like your mm. own children it doesn't mean you hate other children you just like you, you care mostly for your own children mm-hmm. and and for your own family and then then it goes out to you to your neighbors and to, and so on to your nation it doesn't mean you hate other people do you but you have mm. because if you and if you don't think that way you can't invest in anyone because if you're giving to the world, what does that mean actually? To give money to the world, it means nothing. It's incredible, incredibly selfish, in fact, because you give to no one. So, um, so Bob Hawke once once uh, admitted in an interview, he said, "Look, it would have been impossible to establish multiculturalism and Asian or non-white immigration if both parties had not cooperated. Cooperation mm-hmm. of the parties." A bipartisan policy before him, um, Malcolm Fraser, who many on the left see as some sort of hard right figure. The guy was, a, in effect, a neo Marxist. Mm, mm. He was a traitor to his class. He was a traitor to his uh, country, in effect. And, by, and he wrote in his memoirs, he said, I don't believe the Australian people should be permitted to vote on immigration because they always get it wrong. They just get it mm. wrong. Mm. They get it wrong. They just get it wrong. Mm. Why can't they be like me? Bob Hall came along and gave us a oh, famous speech, the bicentenary. The tall ships are about to sail into Sydney Harbour. Seven, uh, right, 200 years since 1788. It's the 26th mm. of January. The mm-hmm. prime minister of the country stands up and gives this great speech. And he said, 
There is no ethnic hierarchy in Australia. How do we define an Australian? There's no ethnic, he, by ethnic hierarchy, that's a really ugly, loaded term. What he meant was, what is Australian identity? And he said, an Australian can be defined as anyone who feels a, who feels a commitment to, to Australia. Just think what that means. This is, this is a guy who was a Rhodes Scholar who went to Oxford, Oxford University, no fool, no nutter, but he said what he said what, what implies the following. Imagine someone from in, Inner Mongolia who watches Australian sitcoms or Australian drama shows. Just quirky, quirky. Yeah, unusual. Not a great cohort. Unusual. We're not a huge but cohort. Possible. But <laughs> and, and say he falls in love with the with the country doctor, with the, you know, uh, with a country practice or whatever it might be. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Just I'm imagine that. Yeah. And he thinks, yeah. wow, what a great country. I feel a real commitment to Australia. According to our Prime Minister, he's an Australian. Mm. But but contrast him with an Australian who's not happy with some area of our policy, like our, our stance towards immigration or... <laughs> Say, for example. A lot, of, <laughs> a lot of Australians are unhappy with, with current policy. And Bob Hawke might say, well, you're not an Australian. You're not an Australian. You don't feel the commitment to Australia. But the person from Inner Mongolia is an Australian. So the reason I, I'm re reminded of this speech, because I hate to admit that I was alive at the time, but um, so was I. It was I was very young, very young. <laughs> an interview given, yeah, an interview given by uh, John Howard recently, like three weeks ago, in which he, he referred to that speech and said, "Yeah, everything he said was true." Mm. So John Howard did not have the intellectual nous to to think this through for himself. Now, how can that be? Well, the problem with with this sort of micro approach of looking at looking at this little this little example and what he said and what she said is that it can miss the big picture. The big picture is that every prime minister since Gough Whitlam has basically been minority centric has put minorities first, for example, in immigration policy. Everyone. It can't be, they can't all have had bad character. It can't be, yeah, but he mm. he was selfish mm. or he was nasty or he mm. was a recovering mm. alcoholic or he was haughty. No, there must be some systemic reason for it. There must be some, ba and, and it's to do with the cultural revolution. Again, it comes back mm. to culture. And it comes back to that globalist enterprise that we talked about earlier on. And it comes back to legacy for people that particularly say Howard, for example, who got into so much trouble uh, over the apology, et cetera, refused to apologise, Indigenous people turning their backs, painted in the media very much as being a racist, et cetera. Now, you think of his legacy, and he knows his legacy will be painted within the apparatus of state, which demands uh, a multi-ethnic understanding of uh, of the West. Yeah. So, I mean, if a politician wants to survive and work his or her way up through a, a major political party, there's going to be screening, screening, you know, along the lines you've just you just stated. And if they get it wrong too often, they've got no they've got no 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 future. They've got no future. Well, they have no future within the political structure itself. It's very clever because there's someone in you'll have a colleague that can use it and weaponize it against you to get rid of you as a potential uh, opponent within the apparatus whether it's the liberal party labor party greens wherever it, it, it makes no difference mm. yeah yeah it's a savage system now this can't be explained without understanding the role of the media the media yeah. have been very important and that's why mm. there's such battles going on now like musk taking over twitter and so on we, we were discussing mm. so this is a, another aspect that is not fully explained in my and on, from my point of view, but it, but the facts are there that without the cooperation of the mainstream media, which began as just newspapers, the, the mainstream media was once just newspapers, mm -hmm. and there were very few universities, uh, this sort of thing with with that level of it, of book reading and so on. So it was the newspapers, and then you got newspapers and radio, and then newspapers, radio, and television from the nineteen forties, fifties on. Uh, why were they on side with this? Well, one, from that theory of corporatism, corporate globalism, it sort of makes sense that uh, the, big, the big media companies were all bought or mm. by, by, by large global corporations. Mm. They're owned by them. They're I an extension the of them. They're an arm of them. I think the solution is going to be 
in that direction of of corporate ownership and so on. And this is why we're having such turmoil right now because the the internet has upset that power structure. So to some extent. To some extent, because you'll get banned off the internet very, very exactly. readily, very quickly. Exactly. And they and they began to look for ways to control access to the internet from an early they they, they realized this was a danger to them. And they began looking for ways of of controlling that. So the so the again one along this line, which is sort of neo Marxist, by the way, it's sort of focusing on economic processes. Um, so they began looking at that and buying up the major media companies, the major social media companies. I mean, mm. hot, big big tech and so on. Mm-hmm. So and the example of Musk is the exception that proves a rule. The example of these thousands upon thousands of small scale media, oh, such as yourself. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, you, you're, you're using this, this medium to, uh, to get around the censorship and so on. Yes. So they're yes. the exceptions that sort of prove the rule in a way. Musk is an interesting figure, isn't it? Because he wants to neurolink us all. He wants to microchip, uh, humanity. Well, I don't know whether he likes to, but he's got this, this, uh, corporation that's working in that direction. Mm. Mm. We, it, uh, I'll just say we've been here before, haven't we? Like as a as a culture, Australia, there was a huge antipathy between uh, Protestantism and Catholicism. Uh, Catholics need not apply for government jobs for, for a long period of time. Somehow, we've seemed to have moved to a point beyond that. Is it a possibility? Like, or what are we talking about with this? Because Australia is a multi ethnic state now. You can't unbake the souffle. Is there a possibility for us to uh, move forward as a cohesive um, entity? Are you saying that demands a predominantly uh, Anglo uh, population, and therefore that's the defining uh, identity of that community? Yeah, my 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 approach is different, and in in. In Anglophobia book, the the position we we take in that is the the rea- the reality is as you say a, we have a diverse Australia so that that that's a reality. So Australia after World War Two ninety eight percent Anglo Celtic was ninety eight percent. There was some lingering friction between the uh, Irish Catholics and the Protestants, yes, and so on. But that that's largely been overcome. Perhaps not in the New South Wales Labor right, but it's still largely overcome. Um, that's not the case anymore. So we're, we're, we've been diversified. Now, because the nation is so diverse, one can't talk about a single united interest always applying in Australia. So, so for example, in immigration policy, um, one might argue immigration policy should reflect the interests of the nation as a whole. Okay, that's that sounds noble. That sounds noble, and I I, I support that. But also, it's difficult to have immigration policy without it favouring one group over another. Mm. So, for example, every group wants access from its own group. Chinese Australians would not want discrimination against Chinese immigrants, Burmese, Greek, mm-hmm. whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Well, they can't all be pleased unless we have an open door policy. We have an open door policy at suicide up for Australia. But if we do begin to restrict it, well, however we do restrict it, it's going to favour one group o- over another. So so what, what I think is necessary as a starting position is for Anglo-Australians, and that's a very broad category. It's very broad. I mean, I mean, anyone who's assimilating into the mainstream Australian identity is for them to say, what about us? What about us? All these policies, multiculturalism, open door immigration policy has been formulated without our input. In fact, we've, you know, the, our, our poll, polling, the, the polls, the result of opinion polls have just been ignored. They've just been ignored. There's willful um, ignoring of Anglo interests in Australia, and I think if if a, if Anglo's are brought into the multicultural system, which which theoretically is democratic and fair, theoretically multiculturalism says, well, people should be able to express their own interests. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. People should be able to vote and lobby according to their 
own interests and the interests of their of their religious or cultural community. Yes, that that seems fair. Why why shouldn't they be able to do that? Uh, but in reality, that's mm-hmm. not the, the rea- in reality. They say yes for every not except how- one. The Australian majority, except one group, can't talk. But as you say, it's happening globally. It's happening in Europe and it's happening in the US. It's in, happening in New Zealand, I'm sure, Canada, here. Absolutely. Uh, so. Is it a fantasy in some respects what you're suggesting? Because power is power and power will need an enemy and power will vilify whoever it's taking its power from. And now a globalist structure is taking power from those uh, former holders of that power, which is the uh, that, those communities, those Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, uh, you know, Western European communities. Yeah, look, I think the reality is we have ol- oligopoly. We are an oligopoly uh, globally. Uh, rule of the rich, rule of the of the powerful, of the elite. But um, we can't stop resisting. We can't mm. stop resisting. Democracy was born, going back to Magna Carta and so on, democracy mm. was born by little people finding their champions, uh, like the Catholic Church. The church in Britain helped... Uh, uh, Magna Carta in 1215. Mm-hmm. So different elites said, yeah, we, we also have a problem with the king, with absolute power of the king. We also have a problem with with making rules up as as mm-hmm. it goes along. So we want rule of law, this this sort of thing. So we it's always a struggle. It's always mm-hmm. a struggle. And we've had it so good in Australia and other Anglo a- Anglophone countries for so long that it's been just taken taken for granted. Oh yeah, we've got it's a free it's a free country. When I was a little boy, you say you can't do that. It's a free country. You <laughs> it was a it was a free country mm-hmm. by by historical comparison, the freest countries that have ever existed. But that had only come about through struggle, through fi- through fighting for our for our rights. And now we're we're technologically equipped with the internet and and so on to to um, establish our own parallel institutions, which I think is a very important movement taking place. Um, and why not, in principle, create or influence b- our own banks, banks that are uh, that do stand by freedom of speech and freedom of association. Is that happening? Are people... It's actually build- happening. People it's are actually- building their own bank banking institutions. Um, that's beginning. I, I've, the example I've come across is uh, what's that? America, there's an American social media website. Mm-hmm. I'm so sorry, it's escaped my mind. That's okay. It's yeah. a Christian, a Christian website, mm-hmm. and I hear that this is a, a trend, very slow, but it's but it, it is happening. So the 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 parallel institutions are being set up. Oh, Jordan Peterson, someone as famous as people will have mm-hmm. heard of Jordan Peterson. Yeah, he's setting up his own university. Yes. Yes. And there's more yeah. than him. It's mm. not just him. There are mm. there are others doing this because they realise universities are critical to our our survival, the survival of freedom. Absolutely, that'll be co opted by the power structure that, as it is now, and and give you the pretense of there being alternative. But the power source will not allow an alternative power source to exist. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I wouldn't be. Ne- I wouldn't be too black pilled about it. Mm-hmm. A great, a great, a great term. I wouldn't be too yeah. black billed. Of course, that is a trend, and and what one would, one should keep a sharp eye for that for that happening, co option, of course. But it doesn't have to be that way. We, I think, we need to. The key thing to do is to raise consciousness. To raise consciousness, people need to be aware of who they are, of where they came from, of their history, and it's very much like. Back in the early days of the the, the civil rights movement in in America, when when black agitators, blacks who wanted their people to have civil rights, have still normal citizen rights, talked about raising consciousness, talking about history. It's okay to be black. We have our own history. We have our own interests. Uh, don't be put down by this hegemonic white white structure. No, what that's going back 1910, 1920, when you had Jim Crow. So you, there was, in fact, a, there was oppression of black, of black America, and they the civil rights movement reversed that. Um, 
So I think I think we should never give up the, the, the fight for freedom. That civil rights movement's now been weaponized as uh, against uh, uh, white majority populations, though, hasn't it? It has, it has. But America, being what it is, which are, as a rule of law uh, country and a democracy, uh, tremendous strides were made by Black Americans um, overcoming Jim Crow. Many of them did it by simply migrating out of the South, and they moved to the big cities in the north, big industrial cities in the north. And an amazing pioneer such as Henry Ford was would employ anyone at the same wage, anyone. Mm-hmm. That's why they flocked, for example, to Detroit and so on, New York and other other places. And they used what whatever strategy they could, and they made great strides. And so you had a black middle class developing, and you had their own newspapers, uh, very important black new- newspapers developed. <clears throat> so they so they'd receive reliable news about. About them, about themselves, and about their own. From an ethnic perspective, though. From an ethnic, from an ethnic perspective. perspective. And in that it comes back to a race all the time, doesn't it? We're not allowed to talk about race, but it comes back to race all well, the time. Well, it's not just race. Um, it can be culture. It can be Col- religion. Well, that's part of it. Yeah. Important. But mm-hmm. no, race is, mm-hmm. uh, religion's not part of race. Mm-hmm. These, mm-hmm. Are, these are different ways to form communities. Um, ethnicity is important, but it's not, it's not unique. It's not the only. You know, but are- I grew up in an Irish Catholic tradition, and I was struck when I went to Spain how it was uh, still Catholic, but it was very different culturally. It was very different culturally because of the uh, mores of that community, which I would say did come down to how they interpreted it through race, through uh, that Christian tradition. Did you just say that they interpreted it through Christian tradition? The, through they they interpreted the same ostensibly the same Christian tradition, Catholic mm. Christian. But I grew up in an Irish Catholic understanding interpretation of it, which was very different than that um, the uh, Spanish interpretation of it was. How did race come into that? Or, or- well, I just say it would be their cultural, their racial understanding of who they are, how they express themselves. There is a bio spirit to a Spanish community, which is different than the bio spirit of an Irish community. Yeah, yeah. Well, it could which is to, the to Irish do with many things. Australia formed its attitudes as a diaspora. In Spain, they're in their in their ancient homeland. So that that that, that that's one difference. And also, sure, the- but I'm sure if you went to Ireland, you would see there would be a huge difference between Irish Catholicism and Spanish Catholicism, even in their uh, their homelands. Yeah, it could be, yeah. and I. I I think one one pointed aspect, let's bring this religious aspect back to the topic, connect it even more closely. Um, uh, pastoral, the pastoral duty of the church is up for grabs. It's been it's been changing, and I think being undermined for the last uh, seventy years. The, the The Catholic Church once respected and promoted the ethnic interests of its people. Mm. So the Catholic Church has always cared for the individual. It's cared for the family very much, right? It's cared for the local, for the clan, the extended family, and it cared for the local community. So, for example, if a city was being besieged by barbarians or by the neighbouring na- nation, the city was being besieged and behind its medieval wall. You go in, in, in Europe, they all, all have these, they have these medieval walls, mm. Um, the church was not saying, open the gates. It, it's the brotherhood of mankind. Mm, what are universalism. You <laughs> just open up. Just We're yes. all the same. Everyone's yes. the same. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Mm. But uh, we've evolved they, now. We've evolved, did, Frank. We've evolved to a new point, yeah, a new man, <laughs> what, a new what understanding. Said, what they said was, God is on your side. It's right for you to, to, to defend your city against the barbarians or against the next city-state. It's right. I mean, there was excesses in that direction, of course, but they were basically loyal. And, and you can see that, that within the framework of the pastoral duty of the church, which serves different layers of interests from individual to family to, to nation to ethnic group. That's all gone now. There's no pastoral duty by, by the mainstream church, by many minorities, but not, not the mainstream churches, especially my own, the Church of England. Um, Anglicans, there's no sense of pastoral duty to the church, to the uh, nation. Mm. In, instead, they've, they've adopted a, a minority-centric 
perspective of critiquing. They've, they've taken on board this critique of, of, of majority cultures, which is insane. Just, it just, it's madness. It's part of the institutionalization of the West, isn't it? Really, the yeah. same structures that controlling uh, organized religion as uh, any other department we've already we've already covered. And all the, and all these bishops go through the same university system. By the way, they're subject to the same indoctrination. I just want to, because we could be here for another hour. So it's uh, such an engrossing conversation, class of civilization. There's so much going on. But before we do, because I know we've soon we've got the vote in Australia for uh, recognising an Indigenous voice uh, to Parliament. And I know you've written an article on behalf of the British Australian community, which is your website as well, the BAC, I might add. So what's the name of the uh, – it's actually a book you've written. What's the name of the book? The, na- the book is the, the, voice t- the Voice to Parliament, colon, The Voice to Parliament, A Statement on Behalf of the British Australian Community by Frank Salter. So, Frank, that's a very countercultural thing to say that a voice to parliament should uh, uh, have a statement on behalf of the British Australian community. Can you just uh, just talk us through that and uh, what you see uh, resulting in at the uh, referendum on the fourteenth of this month? The, the the one extraordinary thing about the this whole voice process, you know, developing the referendum questions and all the rest of it. If you go back and look at the di- different del- deliberative bodies, that that con- the different consultative bodies and so on that were formed, beginning in two thousand and eleven, I think, two thousand eleven twelve, mm-hmm. not one under repre- Julie Gillard, <laughs> under Julie Gillard, they they have of course representatives of of the indigenous, indigenous people, Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. Of course, they have people who are. Loyal members of those communities, not only loyal members, but leaders of the, those local communities coming and saying, what's in our interests? My people want this. We want this. These are our interests. Completely appropriate. They had a lot of white supporters of those. Of those, Also understandable. They didn't have one representative of the Anglo majority. Not one they had lots of Anglo's, but they didn't have one person who was there saying, "I feel sympathy for the indigenous people." Of course, I wouldn't be here otherwise. But I represent the interests of Anglo Australia. Not one, and I've traced it back to two thousand and eleven, twelve. It's it's extraordinary, and so this whole thing has been formulated as if as if. As if Anglo Australia is not in crisis. As if Anglo Australia is just still the boss and it's a, a white-run society. No, no. Since since 1970, roughly, as we've been as we were discussing earlier, um, immigration policy and multicultural policy has been run against the white majority. We've been marginalised. We've been uh, vilified in the education. Our children are being vilified, are being being taught to hate their own history, to hate their own ancestors, and now we're being asked, "Oh, you should vote for for a special, you know, special powers being given to um, an advisory body in the in in the constitution." Mm. Extraordinary, as if as if we don't exist, as mm. if we have no interests. So I I wrote this book. It's a short book, looking at the at this systematically, looking at the whole voice proposal from an Anglo perspective. In other words, yes, I'm concerned about what's good for Indigenous Australians, my fellow citizens, of course, but also keeping in the back of my mind, is it good for the Anglos? And no one talks about that. No yeah. reviews on that book either, I <laughs> can no. well imagine. The, the no. closest to it is, is Jacinta yeah. Price, who calls herself a Celtic uh, Indigenous person, a Celtic mm-hmm. Aboriginal person. Mm-hmm. She mm-hmm. proudly says, well, my fa- I think it's a father. Mm-hmm. It's Celtic background. In other words, mm-hmm. Anglo. And my mother is, is Indigenous. So she's, you know, she's, she, she's the comes closest to that. I think uh, Warren Mundine also has talked about this. It's uh, interesting. It's something I know. I read a chapter from the book and you talked about the dispossession 
of uh, Anglo institutions. It's a really a, just such a countercultural concept that Anglos might even feel like they are being dispossessed because what we hear all the time, of course, is that uh, Indigenous Australians were dispossessed. Yes, well, they, they were dispossessed, but then luckily for them, though, they were integrated into uh, a culture that was leading the world in form, forming liberal democracy. So you know that Aboriginal, in most of Australia, Aboriginal men, because it was initially it was male, male uh, suffrage, they got the vote before Englishmen got it in England. Mm, mm. Well before, like, yeah. like mid-19... Mid or mid nineteenth century, that um, you had in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Australia. Mm. Tasmania, not Queensland. Queensland and Western Australia, as, as the frontier states, were they were they were delayed. That was delayed. But in most of Australia, they got the vote before British men and women got it in in in, in Britain. Mm. So. So it was good. It was good for them, but but the dispossession that's been taking place as a result of the Cultural Revolution of the sixties and seventies. I have a chapter called "Our Stolen Commonwealth." Our stolen Commonwealth, and what do I mean by that? Well, just what I've been what, what I've been saying. The Anglo nation first, the six Anglo colonies, and then again. The, they gave rise to the Commonwealth in 1901. They were set up explicitly to benefit the majority. These are democratic societies, and they were overwhelmingly Anglo societies. So naturally, they they wanted to survive and continue their traditions and their identity. the The Commonwealth was set up explicitly to serve the interests of the nation, which was an Anglo nation. That was reversed by 1970 that was reversed in effect the commonwealth has been stolen from us in effect and mm -hmm. it's now operating against our interests and i define the commonwealth uh not just as government institutions but as the abc for example sbs yes. public yes. broadcasting mm -hmm. as uh, as since the late 1960s all the institutions i would say frank all all major mm -hmm. institutions have joined this deep state this deep mm -hmm. state app, uh, uh, app, app, apparatus, and in effect, they're operating um, against the interests of the majority. It's interesting. I was, and we've been going for a while, so I'll try to wrap it up. But I, I saw a speech the other day by Noel Pearson at the press club where he made this claim and he spoke to multicultural Australia, meaning not settler Australia, and he called quite deliberately settler Australia being those mob, he would say, from the UK. Um, and he said to multicultural Australia, I want to ask you this question. Who do you side with in this debate as far as the voice is concerned? Do you consider yourself or going to be an honorary settler somehow? Um, because I tell you, a lot of you are the wrong colour. I must. I couldn't believe yeah. what I was hearing, and he didn't sort of get much opprobrium in the mainstream because the mainstream would never want to be seen to uh, criticise someone indigenous and of that stature. A man too has made himself a millionaire out of the largesse of uh, taxpayers' expense. It was an extraordinary claim to make, and and really, if you start to boil it down, since he's asked the question, I would say, well, actually, those people of different colour that have come to this nation have come to this nation expressly to live by what was bequeathed to them by that settler culture, not to come and live as hunters and gatherers might have lived in this idealised uh, picture of uh, Indigenous Australia. Yeah, I think Noel, I, Noel himself seems very comfortable living like uh, a settler too. I might add, <laughs> and and receiving five hundred million dollars um, investment uh, over, mm. over the last fifteen years. Is he relying on the fact that he knows no one will have the gumption to make that claim? He's relying on the, the, we have been silenced through the multicultural instrumentalities that we've already talked about. Yeah, he's 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 uh, arisen. His career and his reputation has arisen sheltered in sort of the sheltered workshop of the of the multicultural system so he's 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 a creature in my view a creature of the multi multicultural uh establishment but warren mundine is not 
you sent a price or not. They're actually free thinking. They they have their I don't agree with everything they say, but these are independent in, individuals, far far more able to sustain a, a rational conversation and so on. Pearson talks ideology and he begins preaching immediately and he can barely talk. And now how did someone like that gain such a high reputation? Well, it's because the Sydney Morning Herald, the Melbourne Age, the ABC, SBS treat him as some sort of uh, mm. paragon. Mm. It, it's a, mm. it's absurd. The man has made vulgar racist remarks about whites, white people, really vulgar. The man has said, uh, I, I, I don't think Anzac Day is appropriate because we should focus on my people's suffering, not on the suffering of Anzacs. Well, a lot of these people you know? would have been Anzacs too, as a matter of fact. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they, Aborigines have been participating more and more in the in the nation. I see that. I see them as a core, a core group in the Australian nation, in Australian national identity. But um, Pearson is is has been given this platform. He writes in the, you know, he has these extraordinary media platforms to express his or express his point of view. But he's actually, when when you listen to what he's saying, um, it's not pleasant. You see now too that the conservative right uh, salivating over the idea of uh, Jacinta Price someday being the first uh, Indigenous female prime minister. I Janet Albrechtson wrote an opinion piece in the Australian recently saying saying such. Well, after watching her perform over the last month or two, uh, I tend I tend to agree. I think I think she's actually prime minister material. There's su- there's not all all that much talent on the um, uh, coalition uh, coalition side, and uh, and she just comes across as authentic, as able to think on her feet. For example, she was her speech her speech become famous speech now to the uh, Canberra Press Gallery just yeah. about a week or two ago. And she said, I'd, li- I- I'd like to, I- 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 uh, opening remarks, she said, I- I- my husband's sitting over there. And I do mean husband, not partner. Yes, yes. Oh, immediately there was a cheer went up yeah. Yeah, across Australia. We're mm. sick of this, this ideological mm. language that's mm. being forced on us. Mm. She meant her husband, not her yeah. partner. She went further too, and she talked about the oppression. She said, "I've got it really badly for saying I'm oppressed because indigenous." And she said, "Well, at least I wasn't bequeathed to a, a man much older than me that I might have been under tribal law at the age of fourteen or something." And she went on to say too, "And I've been I've been doubly oppressed because uh, my convict ancestors were also oppressed to come here in the first place." You heard this. You could hear crickets in the uh, media establishment. So, so funny. They are just like the ABC has become. Uh, it's so appalling. The main change with them is not ideological because they were, that the news and current affairs was captured by the Marxist left in the late in the late sixties, and the science show was captured by by the Marxist left in the you know, at the same time. What has changed is their subtlety. They used to sort of cover it a bit and make make gestures to being balanced. That's all gone. Yeah, they're just yeah. They're, it's, they're naked. Like, it's, it's naked. It's naked. It's amazing. Yeah. It's it's blatant. It's blatant now. And the same with our education system. With The, the curriculum has been, the national curriculum was, was captured by the uh, neo-Marxist left decades ago, and that's trickled down to the state curricula now. So it's uh, it, it, it's really, really poor. And there's been no defence against it from neoliberalism on the other side, has there been? Because that's just been about the bottom line, the bottom dollar, sell as much as you can. We've sold our soul to uh, material wealth in many respects. Yeah, and they're friendlier towards right wing globalism which is corporate based mm. so they they that's their weakness also they receive all their funding from these people so they're not going to criticize them very much uh so again it's 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 left on the on the right you have right globalism on the left you have left globalism and the two sort of nudge nudge wink wink sort of they get along they sort of get along yeah, yeah. but the um the 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 i urge Australians to look at the whole Indigenous issue, including the voice referendum, which comes up in nine days or something, and look at it from different perspectives, but look at it also from an Anglo perspective, from the perspective of mainstream Australia. And what we don't want, for example, is a, is a, is a, to, to destroy and complicate our system of, of government, which is magnificent. 
It's one of the things that sets Australia apart. We have the rule of law, we have representative democracy, we have division of powers and so on. And this would be compromised. And it's just another irony of Pearson's speech, isn't it? That, well, I want an Indigenous voice to Parliament, but I don't want anything that the settlers... <laughs> what? The, the, just, the, it's the, inco- the incongruity is just extraordinary. I don't look on myself as a settler. Um, you know, I, I had uh, a convict ancestor in, in Van Diemen's land. Um, so for many generations, m- my family's been here. I don't think of myself. But even if we take his right. language on face value, what he means is what, what came here. Well, that was the parliament. The parliament that now I want a specific voice to is not of uh, uh, Indigenous origin. Although yeah. you would say it is because we're Indigenous. Oh, this argument could go on and on and on. We've had such a good chat too, Frank. I'm just aware of time and I want people to um, stay to the end of this uh, podcast. So I think, do you want to just tell us where people uh, can find you so they can uh, find out more of this detail? We may well have you back too to, to continue this conversation, perhaps post the uh, referendum. That'd be that'd be fun. Um, people can search, just Google, just a general search for British Australian community, and you and we have a, a website which is the British Australian community dot com dot au, um, and then they can search for if you go to Quadrant Online, go to Quadrant Online. There's a Quadrant web- website, and just do a search for Salter, and up will come all my articles because I have a series of articles on the original. 10 years ago, um, on the original attempt by Pearson to have a uh, constitutional recognition. That's what that was his big thing back then. Yes. So uh, there's critique of that. So the, you'll find resources. One thing you'll find is that this book, uh, as a PDF, it's a free download. So you can get access to the book. I'd also go to YouTube. We have three videos out on YouTube. Search for British Australian Community, and it will come up. We have one on, we have two on anglophobia and we have one on the voice. And there'll be many more coming up, by the way, many more in the next uh, months. It's good that you're getting culture out there because I think this process, we're so far behind the eight ball as in understanding what's happening to the culture, the attack that's on it, the manifold attacks that are on it, that uh, you almost need to uh, uh, reinvigorate what the understanding of the culture was in the first place. So, Frank Salter. Um, co-author of Anglophobia, The Unrecognised Hatred. Thanks so much for joining me at DamienRichardson.online. It's been a pleasure, Damien. You can listen to more great podcasts on my website, DamienRichardson.online. Also, follow me on Facebook, and I'd love to hear your thoughts at facebook.com slash DamienRichardson28. Don't forget to give this video a like. Remember to share and comment to join the conversation and have your say.